Great, thank you very much. Um, welcome, everybody. This is the Academy of Medical Sciences uh, Stroke Lancet International Health Lecture. I'm Professor Tom Solomon. I'm the International Vice President at the Academy, and I want to welcome you to this great event. Put your hand up if this is the first of these International Health Lectures you've come to. All right, well, fantastic. A special welcome to all of you, and also a welcome to the 14 uh, 1,400 people who've registered online to join us. I'm going to wave at them. Online people always feel slightly excluded, but I'm going to look right down the camera and wave at them. Thank you. Um, so uh, this is actually, for me, this is the favorite event of the year that the Academy of Medical Sciences does. It does lots of great things, but this is, uh, it, it's really great because we engage with such an international audience. And tonight, as you know, we're going to be talking about the Climate Crisis, Cities and Health, with Mark Neuerhausen and others. We'll come to that shortly. But I, I wanted to let you know that actually over the last two days, the Academy has been jointly hosting with the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science a workshop on public health and climate change. So it's an especial pleasure to welcome Professor Famiko Kasuga, who was the co-chair of that, and uh, Professor Vital Katikiredi, who is actually our own newly appointed Academy Fellow. Great to have you here. And we'll be hearing from them in the Q&A. And also Professor Naoto Kabayashi, who's the director of the London office of the JSPS. So great to have you guys here. Thanks very much for joining us. And thanks for a fantastic couple of days. And of course, uh, this, I, I asked the team to put up a list of the previous lectures. And if I press the right button, which I have done there, um, you'll see we've had some great speakers and great topics over the year. And in fact, if we'd gone back as far as 2017, back then we had Samuel Myers of Harvard talking about planetary health. So um, this is clearly an important issue. The fact that it's come around again uh, shows the importance with which we as an academy take this issue. The Academy of Medical Sciences, for those who are not so familiar with it, is the UK's independent expert voice of biomedicine and health research. And our vision is good health for all, uh, underpinned by the best research and evidence. And for this uh, event, we partner with The Lancet. So many thanks to Richard Horton and The Lancet team for all their support uh, for this showcase event. Uh, like I said, this is the biggest uh, one we've ever done in terms of audience. Those of you who are young enough to know what a hashtag is, um, which in doesn't include most of the front row, uh, a hashtag is I <laughs> IHL, but does include some of them. Richard Horton's very big on, on Twitter or X. It's hashtag IHL24. So please take fit pictures, use the hashtag, make comments um, as much as you wish. We're going to have the keynote lecture, which will be for about 40 minutes. And then we've got an excellent panel uh, who are each going to talk for about seven minutes. And then we're going to open it up for questions and answers, both from the in-person audience here and the online audience. Um, I just want to tell you a tiny bit more about what we do in the international space at the Academy of Medical Sciences. So, I mean, the Academy as a whole, I told you the vision and I told you what we are, but I'll tell you the three things we do. We basically support careers for brilliant young academics. We fund research, particularly for those young academics, but also for networking. And then in addition, we do policy work. And so this work tonight is part of the policy work. And in the international space, so what I've just described, we do in the UK. We also do those three things in the international space. Right, I think I've told you everything on my briefing and a few things that weren't on the briefing. But at this stage, I'll hand over to Richard, who's going to introduce this year's lecture. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Tom. And um, let me just also uh, give reciprocal thanks to uh, Andrew, you and the whole team uh, at the Academy of Medical Sciences. It is a national academy, but it's a national academy with global reach and global influence. And I think at a time of rampant anti-science, uh, populism and narrow nationalism, it's crucial that we have an academy as we have the Academy of Medical Sciences, that plays such an important role in protecting and advancing uh, medical sciences uh, in the UK and beyond. But let me turn to the reason why you're here this evening. Professor Mark Neuwenhusen, 
He's Director of Urban Planning, Environment and Health Initiative and the Climate, Air Pollution, Nature and Urban Health Research Program at IS Global in Barcelona, Spain. He's a world leading expert in environmental exposure assessment, epidemiology and health impact assessments with a very strong focus, as you will hear this evening, on healthy urban living. Marx edited eight books on environmental exposure assessment and epidemiology, on urban and transport planning and health. He's co-authored 39 book chapters, and he's also co-authored uh, over 600 papers published in peer-reviewed journals. In 2018, he was awarded the ISEEE -E John Goldsmith Award for outstanding contributions to environmental epidemiology. And he's also in the top 1% of highly cited scientists in the world. Not that we care about citations, of course. In 2021, he was ranked the number one scientist in urban health. He currently leads the biannual Urban Transitions Conference, and he's also an editor. He's the editor-in-chief of Environmental Interna Environment International. Uh, a few years ago, he was president of the International Society of Environmental Epidemiology, and he's led five large European Commission-funded cons consortia, and he's involved in many other European activities around environmental health. I think you'll agree with me that he is well qualified to join us this evening and speak about climate crisis, cities, and health. Please give him a warm welcome. Uh, many thanks. Uh, wonderful to see so many of you here and also online. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, to be back in London. I used to work in London. Um, had a great experience, and but now I'm working nowadays in, in Barcelona. That First of all, many thanks to the Lancet and the Academy for inviting me uh, to talk about one of my uh, favorite topics. What is very close to my heart, and I think also very important. This picture you may recognize, uh, it's already a, a few years old. But it is, in a way, I think, what the current situation is, or how I feel. You know, the world is burning around, around us, but at the same time, we just keep doing our things, like nothing happens. We see, we've seen this year, I mean, the consequences of climate change. I mean, I can just give you a few examples. I mean, the flooding, what we see in Central Europe, um, the, the wildfires in Portugal, heat waves, uh, and also for my own Catalonia, where this is a reservoir. Normally, this church is on the water, but because of the drought that we've experiencing for the last two, three years, um, you can see actually the church. We know that the heating um, causes extra flooding, uh, extra rainfall. I mean, it also brings in extra energy to the system for, for further storms, hurricanes, uh, what we have. In 2022, we had 62,000 or 60,000 deaths as a result uh, of excess heat in Europe. And this is likely to triple over the next century, uh, according to the uh, prognosis that we see at the moment, if we don't change. Climate crisis is nowadays also a health crisis. Um, the COP had its first health day last year. I thought it was a bit late, but you know, better, better late than never. But I recognized it and I said from, you know, the climate crisis is a health crisis and we should put uh, health at the heart of climate action. We know that the current climate crisis is already having an impact on health and healthcare cost. And therefore taking climate action could be about saving lives, saving disease, saving healthcare costs. Most of us nowadays live in cities, just over 50%, goes up to 70%. Cities are great places to live. London is a great place to be. But also they're responsible for two thirds of the uh, carbon emissions or the greenhouse emissions. And so cities are part of the problem, but I think they're also part of the solution. 
and the solutions we already have here, but we just need to implement them. And that's what I'll be talking about a bit more. Because if we don't do anything, the future doesn't look so good for our cities. At the moment, there are already more than um, 350 cities with 200 million people that experience uh, temperatures over 35 degrees. And this is going to increase to around 970 cities uh, by 2050 if we're not going to change. We know that cities are moving with their climate towards the subtropic and that, you know, uh, for example, a city uh, like uh, Madrid is going to have the climate of Marrakesh. London is going to have the climate of Barcelona. Now, you may think at the moment, oh, wow, that's quite nice. Wait when you come to, the, to Barcelona for the summers. I mean, it's horrible. The summers are very long, too hot, and we have drought. I mean, is that what you want? Is that what you're looking for? No, I don't think so. Uh, it's not only heat. I mean, of course, it's also... Uh, the risk of, of um, at the risk of sea life arise. Many of our important cities are near the sea, are at risk for this as well. Uh, it's not only C40 that's mentioning this, also the World Resources Institute just published a very nice report looking forward, you know, what are the risks, what are we going to get in our cities? And therefore, if we don't do anything, it doesn't look very good at all. But I must say we have already problems in our cities in terms of uh, air pollution. Nearly two million people die prematurely each year because of air pollution. So this is already something that we need to deal with and that we need to reduce. I mean, why should people die of air pollution in th this day and age? But it's not only air pollution what we have. I mean, here, uh, some work that we did before, we see 200,000 deaths. Uh, because of air pollution in, in a thousand cities in Europe, but we also see that the lack of green space in our cities is also causing premature mortality, premature mortality with 43,000 deaths. 60 million people suffer too much noise in our cities that are harmful for health, and also there are many heat-related deaths in our cities as a result. So let's look at our cities and also at CO2 emissions as one of the main greenhouse gases. And the question, is there perhaps a trade-off, I mean, that, uh, for this? Um, there are a number of uh, good review articles out there that show that there's a clear relationship between uh, the type of city, what's happening inside cities, uh, the design, et cetera, and CO2 emissions. Uh, what you do within the city, how you design it, very, it has a really important impact. I just pick out one paper, what, just to illustrate, um, saying here, this is uh, a, 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 a study from Taiwan where they looked at the different uh, factors that impact CO2 emissions. Uh, and I find that's related and they reveal that they, you know, you could um, reduce CO2 emissions if you minimize the city size, uh, if you minimize the urban sprawl, some industrial levels and also change some of the transportation st uh, status, what I'll talk about a bit later. Uh, at the same time, you should maximize density so people are close together, land use mix, um, commercial interest, and also green space coverage. And I'll come back to this later, but this is kind of what I recommend and what is happening now. Now, the question is, you know, when you look at this kind of things, what does this mean, for example, for European cities? Um, we published earlier this summer a study um, where we looked at a thousand European cities and we asked ourselves, you know, what kind of um, type of cities do we have in Europe? Uh, we use the data science approach and some fancy statistics. And then um, also to see what is the, um, how does this relate to CO2 emissions, environmental quality and mortality? So what we found in this case, there were four types of cities. On the one side, uh, the labels are from us, by the way, what we call the compact high density city on this side and on the other side, uh, where we see the green low density city. Um, the number of people living in the high compact city, I mean, as you may expect on average, are so larger than in the low density cities. Uh, but the, um, the other thing is that the average size of the compact cities is much smaller than the green city. So it takes up less space. Than then when we look at some of the outcomes, what we're looking at, I mean, our main one was to look at CO2 emissions. We find that that's what we would expect is the CO2 emissions are lower per capita in compact cities compared to green low density cities. I mean, the other two are in between there. 
But at the same time, uh, having this kind of advantage, what we also found and what we didn't uh, really expect and we're not hoping to uh, find was that uh, there was also more air pollution in, oops, sorry, uh, more air pollution in the, in the compact cities compared to the green cities, low density cities. There was more excess heat in those cities. And uh, also there was much less green space in compact cities compared to the green cities. The later is not unexpected. But what was a bit unexpected to us was also that the mortality rate in high, compact high density cities was actually higher than in the green cities. Um, here around 1124 per 100,000 uh, compared to 1000 uh, per 100,000. Now the question here you're asking ourselves because the general paradigm is for, for urban planning is compact cities. And then you think from, oh, should we then go for compact cities? Is it actually what we want to do with that? And I say, yes, we should. But we should make a much bigger effort also to do to reduce the unwanted exposures that we have and reduce mortality um, in those uh, compact cities uh, by introducing good policies, including climate action, to reduce um, the unwanted exposures that we have. I'll give you a quick example, because uh, Barcelona, my city, is one of those uh, compact cities. Uh, we estimated before that 20% of uh, mortality is premature because of uh, poor urban transport planning. Um, Barcelona is a wonderful city, but it has too much air pollution, too much noise, uh, not enough green space, the type of things what you get. Um, then I did a quick, on the back of the envelope calculation, what kind of policies could you introduce in a compact city like this to reduce the mortality rate? And what, we, what I found was that if you look at policies that reduce air pollution, noise, um, and uh, to, to levels that the WHO recommends, also increase green space of physical activity to what the WHO recommends, and also reduce the heat waves. Actually, you can reduce the um, mortality rate quite considerably, and then compact cities actually do much better than um, green low density cities. Um, particular air pollution has a large impact in, in Barcelona. We could reduce uh, the rate by about 139 per 100,000, you know, bringing it below the low density uh, city if we reduce air pollution levels. But also green space reduces mortality rates, uh, providing cycling lanes in all the uh, streets in Barcelona reduces this as well. So this gives you some kind of indication what kind of policies are possible to do, but we need to implement these uh, policies um, to make this happen. We realize that there are improvements. We know, realize that there is a health burden related to what we do in our cities, and we should work on those to actually reduce the health burden for this. I mean, the most obvious one is decarbonization. Uh, everyone is talking about it. Uh, we really need to do this. Um, unfortunately, we have a real addiction to fossil fuels. I mean, it's, um, I don't know how to get rid of this, but we also know that these fossil fuels are responsible for more than 5 million deaths each year because of the air pollution. Air pollution is a big problem, what I told you before, you know, to a large extent from fossil fuels. Unfortunately, it won't be so easy to change. I mean, still, there are too many subsidies going to the fossil fuel industry, not enough to renewable uh, resources. Uh, we're dealing with a lot of stranded uh, investments, is what I call it. I mean, investments that have been made for fossil fuel that haven't come to fruition. Uh, people don't want to lose their money. Um, also, we still have climate denial at the highest level. I mean, unfortunately, not taking... Uh, really notice of what's going on, even though hurricanes are going. And also we see that not all the climate policies are working. There's a recent paper looking at 1500 uh, climate policies and just over 60 show that they're actually working to reduce CO2 emissions. That at least on the positive side, there are 60 that are working. I think that's a good way of looking at it. But we need to be careful that we don't look at greenwashing, etc. That. That's why I like this particular initiative, the Pathfinder. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. It demonstrates, um, talks about, uh, about climate uh, mitigation action that shows benefits for the climate and also for health. I think this is very important that it addresses both 
um, you know, the reduction of CO2 and other greenhouse gases, and also health. And I have a very nice pathway uh, diagram that I'm always happy to show, where they look at different uh, interventions that could be taken um, to actually reduce uh, the CO2 emissions and at the same time, you know, improve health. Quite a few of those also apply to our cities, could be implemented in our cities. I think for our cities, we're looking towards solutions that reduce CO2 uh, emissions, also inv improve environmental quality, and of course, livability and health. Bringing those together, I mean, that, and sometimes that's not easy to bring them all together, but I think there are solutions for this. And I'm gonna take you through a few just examples to give you some idea of what may be possible then. The first one is about land use. A lot of our public space in our cities is at the moment actually used by cars. I mean, in Spain, 69% of public space is used by cars because our roads are also public space. Parking is public space. I mean, this is kind of space that we could use in a much better way. Um, over the last few years, there have been a number of what I call new innovative urban models that have been proposed uh, and experimented with uh, in different cities. Yourself, you're very familiar here with the low traffic neighborhoods uh, that have been implemented here. Um, some say a bit controversial, others say, yes, it's the things what we need. Um, we have in Barcelona, the super blocks. Um, then what got the most attention, I think, is the 15 minute city that's been introduced in, in Paris. The idea that all your destinations, work, shops, uh, cultural events, um, whatever you can think of, are within 50 minutes of your home. Um, many, many cities are trying to um, come to that. And then we've got the car-free neighborhood. So quickly running some of the work. Uh, there have been some evaluations recently looking at the low traffic neighborhoods. Uh, we've seen a lot about it in newspapers about this kind of things. Actually, when you look at the scientific results, and I'm glad that Audrey is here, who's done one of the studies, uh, it shows that they actually reduce uh, traffic within the areas and not increase traffic around it. They reduce air pollution and also they incre increase physical activity. And physical activity is extremely important for health. Most people don't get enough physical activity to, le uh, to live a healthy life. So it's not surprising that you know, newspapers like The Guardian say from, yes, we need more uh, uh, low traffic neighborhoods because um, they actually work. I mean, although perhaps if you read the Daily Mail, they don't agree with this, but you know, there's a difference that. Then for my own city, uh, we have the so called super blocks. In Barcelona, we have a grid system uh, for most of the city where the cars go up and down, left and right. Um, the idea of the super block is to cut four junctions in a block uh, and only allow active transportation in the middle and also increase green space. Um, so this is one of the super blocks. Um, it's, it's called Saint Antoni. On the top, you see what it was before, uh, a normal road with traffic. And then at the bottom, which you see what it's afterwards, um, more green space, more space for people to walk and cycle that. To me, it's an excellent idea. Really, this area has improved quite a lot. And the idea was to implement 502 super blocks throughout Barcelona. So we did a health impact assessment. We were very excited about it. And we estimated that you could prevent almost 700 premature deaths each year if you would introduce all the um, 502 super blocks in Barcelona, uh, partly as a result of the reduction you know, in air pollution, increase in physical activity, and all these kind of things. Part of the slide has fallen out here then. Then, as what I mentioned, is the 15-minute uh, city. It's very popular. It's been implemented, I think, or trying to implement it in many cities. Unfortunately, I haven't seen any studies relating it to health as such, but we assume that there is more physical activity if you introduce this. There was recently came a study out where they looked at um, to what extent the 15-minute city com um, concept was ap applicable to different cities around the world, and I found that a particular the European cities that we saw already quite a bit of 50 minutes city concept. Uh, many you know, destinations were within 50 minutes walk of the, where people were living. But then if you go, for example, to the US, this is not the case. I mean, very few cities 
actually is where you can walk to your shop or cycle to your shop uh, nearby or, or do this for work. So there's still a quite a lot to do. I mean, it's a nice paper to compare what uh, different cities actually look like. To be honest, this is my favorite uh, kind of urban model. I mean, it's the car-free neighborhood in, in Freiburg, in, in uh, Vauban. Um, unfortunately, it's not being replicated enough, I think, around the world. But uh, if you have a chance, if you haven't been there, please go visit it. I mean, you walk around and you think, oh, God, I want to live here straight away. This is a neighborhood, no cars allowed, have a very good public transport uh, link, a tram to the city center, um, lots of green space here, sustainable housing. Um, the only drawback, it is so popular that the houses are expensive. I mean, but that's it. But if you have the money, go and live there. I mean, it's a wonderful neighborhood, what's going on there. So let's move to mobility. I'm going through some things that, um, at the moment, the bet is on for electric cars. And I think definitely electric cars are not the solution in our cities. Outside may be different, but inside the city is not. I mean, electric car still takes up you know, a lot of space that we could use in a much better way. Still, you know, less tailpipe air pollution emissions, but from tires, there's still, still some noise. Uh, people don't get physical activity. So um, I don't think that is, um, that's good. I mean, the level of the electric cars um, use is predicted to increase. Uh, but at the same time, if you look at the predictions, also car use in general is uh, predicted to increase. At the moment, we've got one billion cars around the world driving around, and this is uh, likely to increase to 1.6 billion uh, cars. So imagine that. I mean, that, uh, and it may keep going. And I think one of the problems with this is, is the current kind of prediction models that we use um, that uh, lead us in a certain way that we can't get out anymore. So the main determinant of uh, cars in the future for the prediction is GDP. In every transport model, as soon as GDP goes up, they predict that there are going to be more cars. So because they're expecting more cars, they start already building more roads. So there is a lot of investment in this, what drives up, of course, GDP. Then also, if you get more cars, people go a little further away from where they work, etc., and you get more sprawl. So you need to build more roads, and then you get more GDP. And you can see this is a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way. You keep going, you keep increasing your, your GDP. And of course, I mean, economists love this. I mean, GDP is, is what you aim for, a higher GDP. But is this really the GDP we want? We need to ask ourselves, and why do we, you know, encourage car use when we know that people nowadays spend about 20, 30 percent of the salary running a car? It's very expensive. I mean, it's not a very efficient way, I mean, that, uh, of doing this. So what we have, this predict and provide model that we see leads to a lot of car dependency because we invest too much in, in road systems and not in the alternative, like public transport, like active transportation. What we need to move to is to a model of decide and provide. We need to decide what we want in our cities and put the funding in there to actually make this happen. I mean, a lot of these things are expensive. That We need to shift the mobility paradigm from to avoid, shift, and improve. Avoid travel if, if, if you can, you know, shift it to active and public transportation and improve what is ever is left. Otherwise, we end up with situations like this. Everyone's sitting in the car and thinking, oh, God, I mean, and imagine when you look at the TV, when you look at this ads, you have always the car driving through nature and freedom or whatever. The reality is more probably more just like this. So we need to change our paradigm. You know, we need to stop planning for cars. We need to stop start planning for uh, active transportation on the top, uh, followed by public tra transport and, and going like this. And this is possible. Because many of our car trips are actually shorter than five kilometers. I mean, we can replace them by active transportation, by cycling. And it's a shame that we don't do this because we know how healthy it is actually to get yourself on the bike. This is a very nice study by Audrey, who is here. Uh, work on going, I, I believe. Uh, she looked here in London to see if we would shift 50% uh, of car journeys 
to an electric car or to walking, cycling, and public transport, what would be the health benefits of those? Uh, she looked at different uh, pathways, air pollution, physical activity, accidents, uh, green space, and noise. And what she found was that you have some benefits of moving to electric cars, but if you move people to walking and cycling and public transport, the benefits are five times as large uh, into health terms than if you go to electric cars. We know that cycling has many advantages uh, or benefits for, for, um, for health. It reduces premature mortality. You know, you combine the gym by going to work. I mean, a lot of people don't have time to go, to go to the gym. So just get on your bike and you get your half an hour that the WHO recommends. Uh, less air pollution, less noise, um, zero CO2 emissions, uh, more public space, uh, happiness. We know that cyclists are much happier than car drivers, particularly when you get stuck in traffic jams. And we know that the benefits of physical activity well outweigh the risk of inhaling a bit more air pollution or that of traffic injuries. For me, I'm, by the way, from the Netherlands, but I've seen this. Um, this is kind of what I love, this picture, Utrecht, uh, a very progressive city, amazing policies actually to stimulate cycling. And I think now 80% of trips are actually by bicycle. And you don't see so many cars anymore in Utrecht uh, for what's going COVID was bad, but it was also a great experiment to see actually what works. I mean, and what was interesting, a number of cities uh, put up new cycling infrastructure, cycling lanes, while other cities didn't. And those guys used the data and looked at, did cycling rates actually go up in those cities where they put in cycling infrastructure? And actually, yes, what I saw within four months, you know, there was quite a bit more cycling infrastructure and I saw the cycling rates going up in those cities where they put in more cycling uh, infrastructure. So, you know, paying, putting in infrastructure is important. It increases uh, the use of, uh, of bicycles. This is another study which shows more or less the same, but it's more a cross-sectional study where they looked at 167 ci uh, cities ar uh, around Europe where they looked at the availability of cycling infrastructure and the percentage of people of trips by bicycle. Up to about 25% of uh, mode share, so one out of four trips by bicycle, uh, there was a direct relationship between the availability of uh, safe cycling infrastructure and the number of people cycling. For me, it shows that how important it is to provide infrastructure that people feel safe that they can go to cycle. They always say, if you build them, they will come. And this is, I think, actually the case. And as you know, also cycling actually produces much less CO2. I mean, here is a comparison. I think cyclists at 84% lower life cycle CO2 emissions than non-cyclists in this uh, uh, study. I mean, so you can see it's actually a very large reduction in CO2 that you can get if you uh, move trips um, to active transportation, including cycling. Then. Now you think, is this all possible? Can we actually reduce CO2 levels? And uh, Clean Cities, a city organization that is quite active, recently did a study in five European cities where they looked at different policies can to reduce CO2 emissions. Uh, they were quite varied. They did some modeling. But they showed that if you apply these policies, you really significantly can reduce the CO2 emissions up to 90% in our cities by 2030. But you need to really apply the policies, you need to enforce them, you need to get them going, and then we can reduce the CO2 emissions, this is for transport, by the way, for transport. So it is possible with existing, you know, uh, policies that can be proposed. And, um, of course, there are also some other measures. I just want to mention the low emission zone, ultra low emission zone, what you have here in, in, um, in London, uh, and also uh, congestion charging. They actually do work. I mean, we've shown, seen this. Uh, there's a lot of resistance or for, from a small group, but it's actually working. Um, I'm also excited to let you know that on this November 7th, Bradford is going to announce their results for the low emission zones. We're all looking forward. My friend John Wright is here. Um, and uh, keep this date in your agenda. It's going to be an important date. But it's not only about mobility. It's also about greening. Greening, I think, is very important as well. Over the last 10 years, we got to know that uh, green space is actually very important for for 
uh, for health. We know it reduces premature mortality, reduces cardiovascular disease, uh, cancer, and particularly it's important for mental health, stress reduction, uh, but then also for other things like um, reducing urban heat island effects. This is a study in about 100 cities in Europe um, where they looked at what are the mortality related to urban heat island effects. Generally, the city centers are four or five degrees hotter than surrounding areas, but uh, as a result, you get more mortality. Here they look for if you increase tree cover from the current 50% to 30%, how, by how much can you reduce the temperature in those cities and then reduce the mortality? So in this case, what uh, they showed was that you reduce the temperature by 1.3 degree on average, but doesn't seem to be a lot, but you could reduce about a third of the premature deaths due to urban heat island effects. This is a nice study that look at different uh, green infrastructure, nature-based solutions to reduce CO2 emissions, uh, both directly and indirectly by making the environment nicer for uh, more climate um, sensitive behavior. And actually they also find that introducing some of these measures, they looked at specific cities, you could reduce uh, carbon emissions by about 20%. So it's, I think it's a considerable uh, amount. Green space is important for cities and the cities love to do work on this because everyone loves green space. And uh, Professor uh, Cecil Kaninendijk uh, proposed the so-called uh, 330, 300 green space rule that cities should uh, introduce. Here the idea is that every citizen should be able to see free trees from their window, live in an area of 30% uh, tree cover and live within 300 meters of a major green space. Easy to remember, free, 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 the free rules for green space. And actually now we see many cities trying to implement this. Of course, this is not always easy because the space is not, because a lot of our space is taken up by car infrastructure. So we need to work a bit harder to introduce this that. Finally, I want to make uh, mention housing. Um, we have a housing crisis in many countries. There are things about building houses. I think also here in the UK, they want to build houses. Where are you going to build them? Um, we don't want to build them in areas where we get outside the cities, where we get more sprawl. To my surprise, Europe is one of the biggest or biggest, oh no, what's the uh, quickest uh, sprawling uh, continent uh, because we've been building, you know, on the sides of the cities. Um, because we have more cars, we drive or whatever, we should avoid that. Therefore, I think we should not go for single family houses, what we've been uh, looking at. On the other side, you know, because this is not the right density, we also shouldn't go to high rises. I mean, it's also not a very good way of living, I think. We should go to a certain density, low rise density, that people feel comfortable, where you get, uh, have uh, mixed land use, um, and that you actually can live. We should be loving, uh, looking at apartment building, but sustainable apartment uh, on a human scale, four or five uh, stories high. Uh, of course, with um, the latest technology like the, the heat pumps and also with uh, solar panels. Of course, retrofitting comes, uh, comes in there. Uh, we have a lot of old uh, building stock. And also at the same time, we should be looking back to ancient cooling techniques or warming techniques that we see in many countries that had this kind of experience, how to build. I mean, again, coming back to the single family houses, this is not the way to build. If you look at all the cities, I mean, they're much more closer together um, to uh, protect this kind of things. Of course, things are not easy. Um, and this, I picked this up from a nice a uh, paper where they did a review, where they looked at some of the barriers and facilitators, including, you know, what you need is political will and leadership. I've seen it in my own city in Barcelona. Uh, the previous um, leadership were very much in favor of the super blocks. The current leadership doesn't want to know about them. That was the thing gone out the window. Uh, it's a bit of a problem there. We need the evidence base and practice with tools, uh, embracing complexity, particularly also working on translation and communication. I think that's where we go at times wrong. As a, a researcher, we think, ah, oh, this is important, it should be done, but how does this work in practice? How do you convince people that are not convinced, uh, I think? And also looking towards co-production. 
Of course, making these changes is expensive. You need to have the resources, human resources, financial resources to do this, and also the collaboration. Of course, I mean, what we also see in many of this, it's a struggle for power and influence. Uh, there's a lot of vest invested interest that is very hard to move. I mean, um, also the lobbying that goes on. Us as health professionals, we're often quite weak in this particular. So we need to work with others. I mean, uh, I think here there are many health people. We can, you know, show what are the, uh, the health impacts, but we can't change things. So we need to work with other sectors, including education, for example. I mean, too many kids going to school by car. Why do they go to school by car? Well, they could be cycling. Well, they could be walking. I mean, get an independent life that... So in this way, I think we need to look, you know, at a sweet spot, bringing different communities together within the city. At the moment, we still have too many silos. We have urban planning on one side. We have the environment department, the other. Transport, climate action, health, all fighting for money, all fighting for resources, saying that they want to do their things. And actually, they should be sitting together uh, in groups and come up with a common vision uh, for this. Uh, I must say, in my own city, uh, Ilde von Sada at the time in 1815, he had the advantage of being able to do this. He designed Barcelona with health in mind, uh, with a lot of green space in the developments, uh, also white streets for a lot of fresh air. Unfortunately, the green space disappeared when the developers came in, what we often see. And also the white streets got taken over in the 1960s, 70s by cars, because that was thought of being modern. I mean, was never intended to be. If you look back what he wrote about the city, how to design a city, you would love to live in that kind of city, but it's not possible. So hopefully I've shown you that there is a relationship between urban design, how people get around the city, how this leads to environmental exposures, lifestyles, and also to disease and more mortality. At the moment, we see still too much disease and mortality that could be prevented. What I see is that us as health professionals always be cleaning up the dirt, what's happening in the urban planning and the transport planning uh, department. The problem, I think, is partly because most of the health professionals are working in the right side of the picture, and you see very few health professionals in the left side of the picture. I encourage you, if you're a health professional, go to urban planning committees, go to transport committees, and tell you that what they are doing is, has an important impact on health. We really, you know, when I go to this kind of conferences, uh, committees, they don't think about health at the mo uh, most of the time. Transport planners generally think from how do I get a person as quick as possible from A to B? Not what is the healthiest way of getting a person to A to B. No, how do I get the quickest? Okay, build another road. And they go. We need to have more people that say from, hey, hang on. Think about health. Take this into account. So, are these changes possible? Sometimes it seems that this is not possible. A lot of um, barriers. But, you know, there are some examples. This is uh, South Korea, uh, Seoul, where they first had a major road in the middle of the city. They tore it down and they made some nice waterway with green space. Uh, much nicer place to be. Um, well, to German car-loving country, even there it's possible to actually, you know, take away road space and make a nice um, water area. I think that's enjoyed by many more people and looks also much nicer. Also, when you think about Amsterdam, people think about cycling in Amsterdam. Amsterdam was not always a cycling city. Amsterdam in the 1970s looked horrible. Unfortunately, a few kids had to die before they actually made changes. But nowadays, you know, Amsterdam is a cycling city. I mean, the roads have changed. I mean, we can change. I mean, change is possible. You know, much better for health, much better for the climate. This is one of my favorite uh, streets in Barcelona. Please don't go visit it, otherwise too many people are going. That. But it's a pedestrian street with cycling lanes on the side. Um, tree cover to keep it very cool in the summer. It's much nicer there. Also, there are many shops. There are many restaurants. People live in the area, and it's a wonderful place. I mean, that's what we, I think what we should be aiming for. Unfortunately, too many neighborhoods, streets, and cities are not like this, and I think we should be there. So, 
hopefully I made a case that we should take um, climate action and it's, uh, it's very good for health. Um, we should, you know, not have cities that are detrimental to health, but are actually promoting health. That gives people the possibility to walk around, cycle around, to get their physical activity they don't need. We need innovative measures, not only with healthcare as such, but also in our streets and our neighborhoods and cities to improve the health of citizens. And we need to have the multi-stakeholder approach. I was a bit imagining, you know, what kind of scenarios do we have for our future cities? And I came up with four scenarios, what we could look forward to 2050. I imagined if you want to have a carbon neutral, livable and healthy city, you could go there, you take climate action, you could improve your city. People are living a healthier life, uh, uh, a life that they enjoy. Um, on the other side, you know, also it attracts people. On the other side, you could have a city with an urban decline that don't attract uh, they don't do any climate action. They fail to act on what's happening. I mean, what you get is that you get an infrastructure collapse, you get environmental degradation, um, people move out because they don't like the city anymore. Uh, and of course, I mean, you get failed governance and also poorer health for those kind of things. Now, I believe it's up to the cities themselves if they're willing to invest at the moment to go to the first scenario towards this, you know, carbon neutral, healthy city, or if they don't invest, if they just keep biggling about, uh, bickering about things, you know, not taking climate action and end up in that category. We know there are cities that are shrinking at the moment, uh, but there are also cities that are growing. So where do you want to be as a city? Finally, thanks so much to my team. I'm always doing the talking, but my team is doing the hard working. Uh, I've got a great team working on this. Um, here we were celebrating the paper on the clusters for the cities. We try to celebrate when we have some nice papers. Um, and, and many thanks to them. And I'm happy to take any questions if you have or sit on the panel for any questions. Thank you so much for your attention. And I'm sure you convinced this audience. What we're going to do now is divide the next period of time up into two parts. First part is we're going to have some responses from three brilliant individuals who I will introduce you to in a moment. And then Tom is going to lead a question and answer discussion with you and also with our online audience. So first of all, let me do some introductions to our discussants. First of all, uh, Dr. Marina Romanello. She's my boss because she is the ex executive director of the Lancet Countdown, um, which we have the privilege, uh, and it is a privilege, to publish every year. Uh, she's responsible for steering 300 researchers worldwide, uh, which is what the Countdown has become now with all the regional activities. She's based at University College uh, London. She's a principal research fellow there. Uh, and she also, in her spare time, is responsible for planning the NHS's net zero strategy. So a little busy. Let me, are we all connected to Ma Maria? Maria, Hi. there you are, fantastic. <laughs> it's such a pleasure to see Maria on the screen. Maria. It, it, of course, there are many people who've shaped WHO's leadership, but, but Maria is the person who, over many years, has tenaciously guided the World Health Organization into a position of leadership on climate and health. And I well remember, Maria, when climate and health was not the subject it is today, was not as popular as it was today, but your personal leadership has been absolutely incredible, and I do want to acknowledge that to this audience. Um, you are Director of the Department of Environment, Climate Change and Health at WHO, based in Geneva. You've had many different lives. You've worked for MSF, you've worked in armed conflict situations in African countries, 
you started off as a medical doctor uh, and you have been nominated at least once as the, one of the top 100 policy influences in health and climate change. You're from Spain originally, and I believe that the Queen Letitia of Spain uh, gave you an Extraordinary Woman Award. So congratulations, Maria. And then third, it's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Nihir Dasandi. Nihir is a professor of global politics and sustainable development at the University of Birmingham, my alma mater. Um, so it's great to see you here, Nihir. His work focuses on the politics of sustainable development and human rights. He's a member of the Working Group 5, that's the Public and Political Engagement Working Group of the Lancet Countdown, and he's also part of the Countdown in Europe. So we're going to start off with Maria first, and then, sorry, Marina first, then Maria, and then Nahir. So, Marina, over to you. Excellent. Well, thank you so much uh, to the Academy for having me here, and thank you, Mark, for such an outstanding presentation. It's hard to think about what to say after everything that you run us through because you've been so comprehensive. So um, I'm going to perhaps take a bit of a step back and rather than focusing on cities, focusing a bit more on the big picture and draw from some of the findings of the Lancet Countdown, I should say we're about to publish our new report. So if Richard allows me, I'm going to give you some of the key findings of that report. Uh, is that for me? Yeah, of course, of course. Um, so for the boss. <laughs> well, I, I'm glad I have this new title. I want to take more advantage <laughs> of it. Um, so basically what we see at the Lancet Count, and we do this monitoring year in year, um, we have over 60 indicators monitoring the links between climate change and health. And what we see every year, the first one started in 2016, so right after the Paris Agreement got signed. And the idea of the Lancet Count back then was to monitor progress on health and climate change which I think we should redefine our name because we've been tracking lack of progress more than anything on health and climate change. The whole idea of the Lancet Countdown was to see the extent to which when we delivered on the goals of the Paris Agreement, we would also deliver those huge health co-benefits that Mark has already talked about, that urban redesign, those better livelihoods under the understanding that we care about health, not just about disease, and that health happens in our cities, in our workplaces, in our homes. So that transformation that we need to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement is a huge opportunity for health. Unfortunately, what we've been seeing year on year is that in the vast majority of the indicators in which we monitor the hazards, impacts, and uh, exposures to climate risk, things are getting very rapidly a lot worse. And what we're also seeing with big concern is that progress towards adaptation, that is kind of the, 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 the mitigation of the risk and the reduction of the negative impacts of climate change has not been nearly fast enough. One of the big findings that we have in the report, and this comes from data that is actually collected by the WHO through a, a, a huge effort that they do, is that it is the countries in the, in the most vulnerable situations, the poorest countries, the ones that are lagging in the adoption of adaptation measures. And those are also the countries that have the highest burden of climate change risks. The ones that are most affected are the ones that are being most left unprotected. And when we delve a bit more in detail on why that is, the answer that they give to the WHO survey is that they haven't implemented potential life-saving adaptation interventions because of lack of technical resources or because of scarcity of funding. So I want you to keep that in mind because this year is gonna be COP29, also labeled as the finance COP, when the need to fund and to increase our ambition to support the so-called developing countries will be at the center of the conversation the 100 billion that was promised in 2009 uh, to be delivered annually by 2020 got delivered, we estimate, with two years delay if it got delivered with a lot of double counting issues. And now we have to increase that ambition. The estimates are that it should be somewhere between 500 billion to 1 trillion annually delivered to so called developing countries. So when we look at what that funding needs to go to, it needs to go to a just transition. So when we look at progress today on, on mitigation and reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, there has been some progress. We're growing quite rapidly the adoption of clean renewable energies, but it's not displacing fossil fuels. So fossil fuel and, and energy-based emissions have reached record high levels uh, last year, the year before, and the year before that. So we keep on increasing our emissions. And the most concerning thing from a health perspective is that the transition towards clean energy has been deeply unjust. 
with those countries that have the most vulnerable populations still suffering from high levels of energy poverty, about 1 billion people around the world still served by healthcare facilities that don't have access to, to energy, and about 92% of the households in, in the poorest, most vulnerable countries still losing biomass to meet their energy needs, exposing their families to very high levels of air pollution, putting children and women in charge of collecting the fuel, exposing them to hazards, exposing them to the dangers of that activity and keeping them away from work and from education. So there's a lot that needs to be done in terms of tackling climate change, but there's a lot of very harmful ways of doing that. And the important thing to keep in mind is that we need to put people back at the center of that conversation and ensure that as we deliver this transition towards net zero, that we're prioritizing not leaving the most vulnerable communities behind, ensuring that we're uh, improving access to energy, which renewable energy can provide off-grid, locally produced, with local labor force, uh, and independence from the big, big fluctuations of the international oil and gas market. So as we head to COP29, this will be kind of at the center of the conversation. There will be a lot of talk about finance, and I just will leave you with kind of two extra points. One is that we're still um, giving, we estimate with a new report, about one trillion or $1.4 trillion um, each year to fossil fuel subsidies, to net fossil fuel subsidies. So there's more than enough money to go around. And that is because we're still absolutely dependent on fossil fuels to meet our energy needs. So countries are held at ransom. Fossil fuel prices go up and they have to allocate billions and billions in resources to keep uh, energy affordable. And the other last thought that I wanted to, to keep you, uh, to, to send you off with is um, the role of the healthcare professionals in this. The health sector globally is responsible for about 4.6 to 5% of all uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We are, if we were a country, uh, about the fifth largest contributor to all global greenhouse gas emissions. But importantly, we also control about 10% of GDP. And the cascading impacts of decarbonizing our activity could be huge. And it's not only our duty, but also we will have no choice but learning how to deliver care in a net zero world. So doing our fair share uh, is not only a moral duty, but we will actually have no choice and we have a lot at play. So I, I, I do hope that we will see more and more healthcare professionals on the table during the COP negotiations and other climate conversations. Thank you, Muna. Thank you. So off to Azerbaijan. <laughs> yeah. Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And thank you so nice, so much for that uh, kind uh, introduction that you made. Uh, I remember that those times when we were very much we alone, How do we turn you the were already up? with Hello, that. Maria, we can't hear you. So oh. I'm just looking around for somebody who's technically minded, which Can I'm you hear me? not, to figure out how we turn the volume up. There's an echo now. Shall we try again? Hello, can you yes. hear me now? Yes, we have you. Okay, wonderful. It was just a tactic to make sure that you will have, I will have all of your attention. Is that the case? <laughs> okay, I was saying, Richard, that thank you so much for your kind introduction. And I still remember very much those times when we were quite isolated on this argument, but you were already with us. So thank you very much for coming to Paris and coming to all the COP whenever we ask you, and you have been extremely supportive. Dear Mark, uh, your presentation was absolutely brilliant, solid, passionate. And I have to add another one because you were very elegant today. I never saw you before wearing a tie. <laughs> oh, well done. Just before I start with my reflection, uh, Mark started his presentation with uh, people playing golf while around it was boarding. Just a provocative thing. Did you see any woman around that picture? <laughs> okay, I leave it there. No comment. But I am sure if they, if they were women, their reaction wouldn't be the same. But just to start. Um, one reflection, yes, we have advanced a lot on putting health and climate change higher on the agenda. Yes, we have the COP28 with 150 countries signing the declaration, a health day in Glasgow, the health commitment. So it's definitely an, incre in an incredible exponential growth. Are we at the level 
the magnitude of the problem will require, not yet. So don't give up because we are really on a critical moment where health is occupying a good space, that's true. But we now need to have a strategic alignment among all of us, among all the forces, among all the evidence that we are generating to make sure that we are not going in different directions and will not allow those who are negotiating to play around with this, diverting our resources and not focusing on what we need to respond to. My second point is about um, the, uh, the uh, negotiators. Uh, uh, we will have another COP now, unfortunately, because in my opinion, any COP is a demonstration of failure because it means that we are not advancing as if we should after 29 years. So I hope we will not be keeping entertaining many, many COPs and we will have some resource. The negotiators are now presented with very strong arguments where they need to realize that they are not just negotiating the level of emissions or the percentage of emissions we need to reduce. We have enough scientific evidence now to tell them how many lives and disease they are negotiating with. And this is where we need to have a very strong argument uh, to pass in COP29 to the negotiators. Anytime you take a decision, be aware that that decision will have these consequences on our health, on the, the mortality level of certain diseases and the expenditure in our hospitals. Point number three, technology. Marta was describing solutions, innovation, good uh, technological uh, news. Uh, we uh, are talking in China about those sponge cities. More and more, we need to be prepared to work with the urban planners, the architects, uh, the, the, the ones working at the city level. And I have the impression, Mark, that sometimes they are better prepared, more advanced, more engaged, and more passionate than our public health officers working at the city level. So we need to sort it out that and create these very strong arguments for our uh, public health officers as well to push at the city level, at the urban level for engagement with the urban, healthy urban planet. Um, we need to, we are talking all of us about artificial intelligence and that can provide very good solutions, particularly on reducing our own greenhouse gases emissions and, and the telemedicine, digital medicine. We need to be part of that discussion on a very strong way and probably with more uh, power and, and, and more, um, we be more convinced that this is our role as well. But it's not just artificial intelligence if we don't have the natural intelligence to do it. And I'm afraid we are missing the natural intelligence here because air pollution is now reaching levels that it are absolutely unacceptable and, and, and something is happen, happening to our IQ. Other ways I cannot explain the fact that we are not reacting to the 7 million deaths, premature deaths every year at the level that this will require if it was another type of uh, public health threat. The role of mayors. Um, I think we need to use them in the right way. I'm coming back from Beijing where it's amazing to see that finally they are controlling air pollution. It's true that they took a very serious political decisions at the highest possible level, then they can go down. And you know, when you have a certain political system, you can implement those measures in a very active and in quick way. Maybe we don't have that in other type of uh, um, state, I mean, in other part of uh, governance, but it's still, it's feasible. China can do it. China is controlling air pollution. It's not the case in India, for instance, where we have mayors that are not um, with the same level of uh, ambition in the name of health or in the name of economy. I don't know what is the motivation, but whatever it is, they need to put in place. Uh, and, and we can demonstrate that it's possible. Anne Hidalgo in France, has in Paris, she has been uh, receiving the threats uh, that uh, and, and her family and everything. So, and she's still pushing, but she has been threatened by certain industry that was very upset because 
they see as a kind of threat. So we need to help those mayors who are doing the right things. We need to remember the tobacco uh, campaigns when uh, certain people who were very much against the tobacco companies, they were not very popular among the industry. Now we have to identify those mayors who are not doing well, but we need to identify as well those who are doing well and probably supporting them and helping them to advance. And in order to do that, we need positive arguments. And I think we need to work a little bit more on that, on giving the mayors the right health arguments for them to advance, quantifying all the time how many uh, cases of diseases they are saving, uh, the, the um, cost for the health system that they are able to reduce, uh, engaging with them and telling them to engage with uh, health professionals, with uh, associations of pediatricians or others in the city that can support them on their decisions when those decisions at the beginning are not very popular. Remember that until not very long time ago, we were smoking in the plane, we were smoking in the elevators, we were smoking in the hospitals. And uh, at one point I said uh, that uh, the, the air pollution is the new tobacco. I was wrong because the new tobacco in many things, yes, but tobacco we have only one enemy, one industry enemy here. Certainly the list will be longer, but still there are many communalities and uh, the fact that years ago in the around the Coliseum, we have plenty of cars, nobody will accept them now to have cars around the Coliseum, but we need to keep this battle, but at different speed. And for that, I think mayors can be our first uh, supporters if we give them the, the, the positive um, quantification of our health that can help them to get more votes. And uh, thank you very much, all of you, Marina. We are very proud of you, of course. So remember, no excuses, no regrets on our interventions and health. Uh, um, and mayors can be our new, powerful health ministers. All right, thank you. Fantastic, Maria. Oops. Um, <laughs> I'll keep my words short. They're here. Great. Um, there's a bit of an echo, but I'll, I'll carry on. I think just wait. They'll. I think they need to just reduce the pickup or reduce the volume. Great. Well, firstly, uh, thank you very much uh, for having me here, and and thank you, Mark, for 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 a great talk actually. And um, I was given sort of a semi role of of talking about some positive examples, which, which aren't always easy to find. Um, and particularly as a political scientist, my background, um, the politics is often the area where we, it, it's particularly hard to find those, um, those positive stories. So uh, I thought I'd um, talk about a few things. So firstly, I thought I'd just mention the context in which we're now working politically. So it's come up already a few, for a few times. Uh, Richard mentioned populism at the start. Um, I think one of the things that we can take away is that we've moved from a position um, a decade or so ago where it felt like there was almost no action at all and no engagement um, to a context in which there's a little bit of action, as we saw from, from Mark's presentation. There are some solutions being implemented, even if they're not at the scale that we'd like, even if, the, even if they're not being followed through in the way that we'd like. However, we're also seeing a huge amount of backlash to those small measures that uh, are being put in place. Um, and there's been a huge amount of talk of, of climate change now being really at the forefront of a lot of the populist politics uh, that we see. It's moved from a, a, a sort of peripheral issue for a lot of populist parties to one that is quite front and center. Um, and this is where I do feel um, talking to a, a group of health professionals uh, or in a, in a room uh, that's dedicated to health, um, well, not the actual center, but <laughs> you get what I mean. Um, what, <laughs> Like one of the things that I think the health argument gives us is, is an opportunity to challenge, um, to challenge that political narrative. And uh, the other thing I should have mentioned is, you know, we've moved from the situation of pure climate denial to what a lot of people would call climate delayism, which is that, you know, a lot of these populist groups, what they're talking about is the need uh, to slow down some of these measures uh, for, for other reasons. And uh, that's where I feel that the health argument uh, can come in. And, there is evidence that a health framing it engages the public. There's, there's now a lot of studies 
uh, that test this argument, you know, does the health framing of cli climate change shift public attitudes? And, and there is evidence to support that, even amongst those that might not be that concerned uh, about climate change in the first place. In terms of some of the examples we see, um, I thought I'd mention two uh, that link to the issue of air pollution that, that Mark discussed. So we're doing, all, all three of us, Mark, Marina, and myself are involved in uh, a project called Catalyze, and we're working with the Health and Environment uh, Alliance there, and some of the work that they've done in Poland, for example. So this is a context in which, uh, for the last decade plus, a government that's very anti-climate, uh, very anti-civil society. What we've seen is civil society activism around the issue of air pollution, uh, with, with the health framing front and center, and with health professionals leading that, that movement. Another uh, context, uh, similarly, uh, Zenitsa in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, very, very low, um, histo for historic reasons, very like, low evidence of social movements and people coming out in the street. Uh, but there, due to the uh, health effects of, of air pollution in that city, uh, a big movement to, to bring about change. So there, is, um, there, is, there are examples of that health argument being used to, to push change and to, uh, to motivate the sort of uh, bottom-up movements that are needed to counter some of this, uh, the populist politics that we're seeing. Um, the other thing uh, I thought I'd mention is, you know, a big part of Mark's talk was around the health co-benefits argument. So this is, uh, it's not only that, you know, averting the climate crisis will improve our health in the future, it's that the actions we take to reduce those emissions will have an immediate benefit uh, to our health right now and to those of us that are taking those actions. And again, it's a really, really important point that I think um, we're seeing more and more evidence for this being something that will push people uh, to, to change. Uh, I think the other thing that it offers is it goes beyond simply uh, this notion of you know the, the impacts of climate change and the threats that we face towards. Um, I thought what some of um, what Mark presented was you know a vision, a positive vision of what we want our cities to look like. So it's a counter to some of that negative sort of populist politics of of what's going on. Um, so I think again it's 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 that much broader vision of health that I think uh, can be at the forefront of some of this action. Uh, the thing to mention on top of that though is I think what's fundamental is you know Marina mentioned at a global level. Even at a domestic level, uh, the need for, for thinking about policies that promote a just transition. Um, so we're thinking about those communities that might, you know, that might in the, uh, suffer some, some setbacks in, in that transition to uh, some of the initiatives that Mark talked about and how we're supporting uh, those groups, I think is a really important thing that I don't think has received enough attention. Uh, the, thing, the final thing I wanted to say was, again, just to reiterate what uh, people have already talked about. Um, including Mark, including Marina, including Maria, the, the role of health professionals in all of this. So in addition to knowing that the health argument works, we also know that uh, health professionals, particularly doctors and nurses, are among the most trusted members of our society. Uh, again, there's evidence that suggests that when health practitioners talk about climate change, people tend to listen. Um, if we think about the, the nature of what that populist politics looks like and that, those divisions that uh, arise from that sort of populist uh, politics, uh, health practitioners are in, are in a really unique space, among with maybe a few other uh, professions to really reach out to, to, to different groups. So again, uh, you know, not just in, in, in terms of being at the table with urban planning, which absolutely is essential, uh, but also in those day-to-day -day conversations. I saw that the um, Royal College of Physicians has released this green, uh, talk, green Physicians Toolkit, which again talks about the sorts of conversations um, that doctors might have with patients around what's going on with the climate crisis. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll leave it there. Fantastic. Fabulous. Thank you very much to um, all the speakers. Some really interesting thoughts there. We're going to move on to our questions and answers in a second, but given that you mentioned the Green Physician Toolkit, uh, which has come from the Royal College of Physicians, where I'm a vice president, I do want to flag this as well, because for anyone who wants, who's in healthcare and wants to just know how to do practical things themselves and with their patients, it's all in here. And I'm even going to give one to Richard Horton, because we may uh, convince The Lancet to do a commentary covering this, because it's a really very active, very active thing. Um, but meanwhile, that's called chair's privilege or something. Uh, I'll, I'll now, um, if, uh, yeah, I, I, if I was cheating, I would uh, try and get Richard to agree to cover it. But anyway, <laughs> let's move on to what we're meant to be doing. Um, so, and also I did want to say, I know that for some of the online people, there has been some issues catching all the pictures, uh, seeing all the images. 
but to remind them that the whole thing is being recorded and they can view it there. Um, so apologies for that. But for the first question or comment, I want to come to Professor Kasagua from the Japan Society for Promotion of Science, because as mentioned, we have had this workshop over the last couple of days, so it'd be interesting to hear your reflections, please. Keep talking. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, my name is Fumiko Kasuga, a professor at Nagasaki University, Japan. And um, as kindly introduced, I was um, very happy to chair the uh, JSPS and AMS uh, policy workshop that is held in the last two days, uh, together with my dear colleague, Professor Vital uh, Credit Terry. Yes. Yeah, and um, so um, in the last two days, uh, yeah, and before going back and uh, going to the question, I'd like to sincerely uh, um, uh, thank to the Academy of Medical Sciences to invite uh, nearly 20 uh, workshop participants from Japan. It's a very general support. And, um, and at the same time, uh, this year is the 30 years anniversary of the uh, United King, uh, UK Japan um, um, collaboration of the science and technology. So um, I'm very happy to take this important role to open the question part, uh, question and answer part of this very uh, important uh, symposium. So in the last two days, uh, we have discussed um, uh, how we can contribute to the um, resilient public and public health systems um, um, to the impact of climate change. And uh, one of the major uh, comments raised from the group was that how uh, we can uh, develop knowledge, information, and um, educational um, updates to be more accessible and uh, understandable, usable to uh, the policymakers and healthcare professionals and even to general public to transform uh, healthcare system, public health system, to be more resilient to the impact of climate change. So, uh, Professor um, Nguyen Hutchinson, um, based on your very rich uh, experiences in working with the um, urban planning uh, professionals, um, as urban health scientist, how could you uh, provide and give us some advice or suggestions and to those well discussion point we have gained? Uh, thank you so much and uh, wonderful you're here. That um, if I think about from my perspective, when I think about planning and particularly for healthcare facilities like hospital. What I'm sometimes surprised about, I don't know if it's in your country, is that I put them on the outskirts of cities, the new hospitals, or they put them at places you know, where people only can get to by cars. I mean, and it's ridiculous. You're thinking, what is this going to do? I mean, partly it's perhaps because they charge for parking, so you pay a lot for the hospital, etc. But otherwise, I don't understand. I mean, why do you put hospitals far away from people that is very hard to reach? It's a very simple thing. You put hospitals places where people are. Um, you know, sometimes I can see also that, you know, you want to merge hospitals together and make them bigger. I mean, get better services. But at the same time, this shouldn't be put away for where people are actually living. And so accessibility to hospitals should be easy for people, easily accessible by public transport, uh, walking or cycling so that we don't have to use the car. I mean, and this is one of my main observations, what I often see uh, happening, I guess partly is because land use, uh, land is actually cheaper on the outskirts of the city to go. I mean, and I've had some experiences in Barcelona as well recently, where I had to travel a very long way, very easy to get to by car, but very difficult by, 
by public transport. Um, so this is what comes to mind uh, for me as one of the first issues. Thank you very much. So we're going to, I'm going to take some of the online questions first because they uh, have been a bit deprived of the slides. And um, we, then we'll come to questions in the room and all the speakers know, uh, and the questioners, I'd like people to keep things short. Uh, so let me go for the first couple of online questions, if that's okay. This is from David Pension. Thanks for a great lecture and great commentaries. Um, why do you think city mayors, brackets the C40 club, seem to be working so well together? And are there lessons here for national leaders who are not collaborating so well together? Who'd like to take that and maybe say a bit about the C40 club as well? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe you know a bit more about it. I mean, uh, it's, it's a really interesting question. I mean, one of the things um, that I think I, I do think there are different politics of the city, and I think... Do you want to just tell everyone about the C40? So the C40 is a, a network of, of um, cities that um, are basically committed to, to climate action. Um, and beyond that, I mean, so it's, uh, there's a bunch of initiatives linked to, linked to the C40 as well in terms of particularly focusing on um, urban issues related to climate action. Um, so... In terms of, city, I do think there's something interesting about the politics of cities, and you know, one of the things that I thought was so interesting about Mark's talk is, is you know, this focus on um, when we take it down to the city level, what does climate action look like? I think there are a some real lessons to learn across uh, contexts in ways of of urban planning, of building design, of of um, active travel promotion. So I think. Um, one of the things that that's like C40 and, and that group of uh, that network of cities do is I think there's a lot of policy transfer and learning that can happen by the nature of, of those things. And then the second thing I would say is um, while I think we're moving away from that sort of rural urban political divide over, over you know, some of these climate initiatives, um, there is something about the politics that comes from cities and the, and the push for change and, that I think is, is a really important space that I think could, could further some of these things as well. So I'd say it's uh, twofold, yeah. And to add to that, Marina. Yeah, I'm happy to. Uh, perhaps not so much about the C40, but yes, what happens in cities that I think is quite interesting. In cities, you get a lot more of cross-departmental interaction than you get at the country level. So country national organizations also need to learn a lot from what happens at the city level. They are very good kind of experimental grounds. Perhaps Mark can talk a bit more about this, um, of, of interaction between different parts of government, between different departments, um, and it allows for, for, for the intersection between climate change and health to be addressed much more effectively. Yeah, I guess also cities can experiment a bit more. I mean, and, you know, there's competition between cities. Eh? Do I better than you? I mean, uh, what is going on? And, of course, there's some greenwashing going on because they all promise uh, so much and then not everything is happening. But exchanging this experience is quite important. Uh, and I think what you see at city level is citizens have more power in a way than on a national level, where national level I see too much in business interest, lobbying, uh, and, and also on the EU level, I think what is stopping us to do a lot of things, to be honest, and that's why you see in cities. I think cities can do more, eh? uh, but um, they're on the right track. Yeah. Let's come to, uh, if anyone, maybe nobody has any questions at all. <laughs> okay, oh. <laughs> so let's um, just keep your hand up until a microphone. Let's uh, come start at the front here, yeah. And then also, let's get the next mic to the next person. Keep the microphones right. moving. Thank Just you. Give it I to knew anybody. I was right to get right on the almost front row. Uh, I'm Audrey De Nazelle. Really the, loved your lecture, as always, Mark. Wonderful. Thank you so much and great interventions. My question is, if you could uh, generate any new piece of evidence, let's say you met a little genie out of the bottle and said, you know, a new piece of evidence right under your wing, and you had the opportunity to talk to anyone in the world, who would that be and what would that piece of evidence be? Fantastic question. <laughs> <laughs> Who would like to go first on that? Uh, let me think. Uh, Maria, Maria. I'm a, we give this to Maria. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let, let me do a try. I mean, uh, sometimes mayors are participating in different networks and uh, sometimes the entry door is uh, climate interventions, other times it's air pollution, other times it's social determinants, other times it's uh, uh, economic. Uh, I will propose something. The piece of, of uh, innovation I will propose is how many lives are you saving this year? 
and create a set of criteria saying, okay, in the reduction of air pollution, you can save so many lives and you didn't reach that level. So we can use it in positive and negative and creating maybe at the C40, this is a challenge for you, dear, uh, a competition among healthy uh, uh, agenda for the mayors. They are the ones that definitely ha can have an intersectorial uh, dialogue that we can't maybe at uh, a global level of the same way. So a healthy competition on how many lives you are saving according with the uh, public health issues you are uh, having, but most of them they need to respond to the heat waves. Most of them they need to respond to the issue of air pollution and the traffic congestion. So creating three things and three criteria for to measure the health benefits and then a healthy competition. That will be fun. <laughs> That's really nice. Thank you. Anyone else like one sentence on this? <laughs> you have one yourself, Audrey, by the way. That, I mean, that's, you know, since you raised the question, I think you're good to answer. What is yours? Uh, fair enough. <laughs> Anyone else on that? I can give you a, a whole list of things that we would love to have. But if I could like have a magic wand and I would give you two, not one. Um, <laughs> One of them is the attribution of the health impacts of climate change to anthropogenic emissions and to source of emissions. The reason for that is because it's very important for the loss and damage conversation and to understand the cost of inaction and how much it has costed already not to have tackled climate change. And for that, you need to understand kind of the, the causality and, and where it comes from. And the other reason why that is so important is because it can unlock litigation. And if you know who caused the emissions and the health harm, harms that it caused, it's so powerful as a tool for litigation, and I think we need to get more of that. And the other thing that I would love to have is a bit more of the economic impacts of the health impacts of climate change, so we can understand how much it's costing our economy. The reason being, that's what moves political agendas very, very effectively. So for those two reasons, those would be my two kind of pieces in the wish list. Thank you. OK, let's come to another question from the floor. Yes, and uh, somebody, if someone's got the mic, go for it, yeah. Is it working? I don't know. I think so, Valentin. I'm Robert Scott. I'm an moving. ambassador of the UK Health Alliance. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm getting on. I'm getting impatient. Um, I've been <laughs> at this for 35 years, and I wonder, my question really is, I suspect that citizens' action, including nonviolent direct action, has been a major impetus for changes in many of the of that you talked about today. My question is, is there data about that? Because there should be, and I don't know it. My thought is, what do the panel think about the role of health professionals in promoting or involving themselves in nonviolent direct action to actually get a bit of change going? Because we really need a bit of change. Great, thanks for that. Okay, let's hear some answers to those questions. Jump in, who'd like to go first? Um, so, so citizens' action, basically. Is there evidence to show the impact of citizens' action? And I guess you, I don't know how gently you mean your citizens' action or whether you mean the sort of, you know, the, um, what are they called? The group? stop oil. The stop oil. And should. <laughs> okay. So evidence for that. And also, should we as professionals be more involved in direct action? Challenging uh, question. Yeah. So uh, one of. Uh, David Pension asked the first question, and one of the case studies we're looking at is just how the NHS uh, came about to, to making this commitment from moving towards sort of reducing emissions to actually prompting uh, a, a, a declaration of, of net zero uh, health services. And again, with that, I don't think there's ever a single um, factor that has influenced change, but the, the role of Fridays for Future and direct action came up as creating that space for um, the conversation for, for, for that shift to happen. So I think there were a few things that happened. There was political change, but I think that space, that attention, that the direct action brought about certainly played a role in, in pushing change. The examples I gave, which, um, you know, in Poland, there isn't a commitment to coal phase out from the Polish government yet, although I think people are more hopeful with the political change that's happened. But uh, again, the role of that, that direct action by health professionals um, to push for action on, on air pollution and health and then to move that debate to, to climate change and health, I think has been really important. So, I mean, absolutely, I think, um, I, I think any change that we've seen in society that's been progressive, um, you know, it's, it's hard to see any examples that haven't happened without some direct action creating the space, but then other factors to also play a role. 
Um, in terms of evidence, there is this new database that I keep wanting to look at on climate protests, and it would be interesting to see what research is coming out because look, people are collecting that data. So it would be interesting to see what else in terms of beyond case studies where we know that there is um, evidence. In terms of health professionals taking action themselves, I mean, as, as a non-health professional, I don't think it's, uh, you know, I mean, I think, as I said, I think direct action clearly has a role to play, um, you know, like in, in creating political change. Anyone else on that? Yeah, you know, for, oops, sorry. No, no. Go ahead. Uh, the, <laughs> I've got an echo now. Yeah, I, I think I'm always a bit disappointed that there are not so many people taking action. I mean, that, you know, still it's a small group and they're effective, they're working, but I'm always surprised, you know, it's so obvious what's happening. Why are there not more people involved? In? And perhaps it's coming back to Audrey's question. How do we get more people involved? How do we understand what people, what is driving people, how we can get them involved uh, and actually care about this? And... Um, Definitely, I think physicians, the medical professions could do, do much more. They're well trusted. I mean, you go to the, you know, any normal person, you go to the doctor and they accept anything from a doctor. I mean, I can tell I'm not a doctor, used to. by the way. They used to. They don't. Oh, no, it's still the case. I mean, I know a lot of people, kind of normal people around me, you know, and they accept anything. I mean, you know, and I think doctors should be thinking about simple things like social prescribing of, of uh, walking, uh, social, you know, get out of your car, start walking, social prescription of nature. I mean, go visit nature, this kind of things, I mean, can be very effective. I mean, we've seen that before and they should do this more. But that's what I said also, health professionals, doctors should be getting more involved in urban planning practices in transport. I mean, I think it was mentioned before, why are those so powerful? Because they have much more money, they have a much larger budget of city councils, of countries or whatever to do things. I mean, actually, you know, as a health profession, we live in a little bubble. I mean, a lot of people kind of health is important, but not that important. It's more other things. So we need to get a bit out of our bubble and see what are normal people thinking. How do you get them activated? How do you get them active? And it's not so easy to be honest that. Yeah. Um, no, I wanted want... to say that only the health argument is the one that will change the speed and the ambition level of these uh, negotiations at COP. The day we will have uh, all the pediatricians talking uh, uh, and influencing mayors and telling them how bad is the quality of the air the people is breathing, uh, the day we will have all the respiratory societies, all the cardiovascular, all the health professionals joining it. And the uh, health professional means a, a broad spectrum, right? not just to the medical or nurses. It's, it's many people is involved in public health. So I'm 100% convinced that the health professional will have a role and a huge responsibility and mission. I think the health professionals are now the ones giving a big, big and powerful motivation to be more on trying to change the pollution. Okay, thanks. Please do. Um, Robin, we discussed this a few times, um, and I don't know what the answer is, because one thing that concerns me is the widening divide between the deniers and their look for excuses um, to accuse the other half, and I don't know what the answer is, and I think that research, we're going to commend it to here to search what's, what's the impact of uh, direct action. But what I did want to mention is that the General Medical Council has suspended two medics for um, direct action and for protests, uh, Dr. Diana Warner and Dr. Sarah Ben. And there has been a couple of lawsuits against medics because of direct action, uh, particularly attacks to um, oil and gas funding banks and oil and gas headquarters. So that's something that um, litigators are, are trying to help with. And there's a letter going around, which I'm very happy to send later on, um, where they're collecting signatures to go to the General, General Medical Council to ask them to revoke the suspension of those two medics. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I mean... It's really interesting. I think it's really a, a sort of hot topic. I'm going to take a couple of questions online that, that actually follow on, if that's okay. And then we'll come back to the floor, don't worry. Um, so this is from Aura Najira Aguira, who is, it says, hello from C4 Cities. Is this somebody, you know, okay. And we must move on from friends just talking to each other, <laughs> get, get new, new voices in. So especially if you're a new voice, uh, we, we will hear from you in a second. Um, but this important question, you, you mentioned polarized views. How is disinformation affecting city actions and policies on climate change? And are there any initiatives to address this? 
and then a linked question from somebody called Sri, which says, how do we communicate science better to people and to policy makers? Because this seems to be a critical issue. I think this information is a big, big problem. We recently published a paper on um, here on London on the lower emission zone. I think the title is, is traffic policies at, at risk of populism. And one of the main things what we found out for doing a lot of analysis, this information, I mean, that it's just huge. I mean, and a lot of people just buy it because they see it written. I mean, uh, they're in their own community. And it's very hard to go go into that, uh, against that. I mean, I think that, uh, and I don't, I don't have the solution for this. I don't know what to do. I mean, yes, you can write about it, but you know, we don't always have the time and putting the, the, the facts there. I mean, of course there are some fact checking at times going on, but um, nowadays with social media, I mean, it's so powerful before, you know, you get lots of information and people buy it. I mean, and, and it's a huge problem, mm. but I don't think any of us have the solution. Uh, does anyone have the solution? No simple solution. Close Twitter. Quit, it. Quit social media. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else want to make a brief comment on that? It is a big um, Yeah, I mean, it, it's absolutely a big issue. Um, I think one thing we need to better understand is, is how big an issue it is. So uh, last year, you'll remember when Rishi Sunak was prime minister, he made this very strong statement against, well, in favor of motorists. Um, I don't think the appeal there was to the climate deniers and to the, the, the co conspiracy theorists who are, who are buying that disinformation. So I think there are other sectors that we also need to focus on. I think there is like, absolutely uh, disinformation is a huge issue that we need to, to address. But I think we also need to think about uh, those that are more politically active and are, are actually influencing some of the policies that are going on more directly as well and, and, and some of their views. And just to add to the last uh, point to link it to the last point, we, we did run a survey during that time, and by chance we did a survey experiment where we were uh, looking at health arguments, and, and we found a really bizarre result with the air pollution where it had this very negative effect on people's engagement, and we think it was, it was completely down to the, the fact that the survey was launched in the week that Rishi Sunak made that statement. Um, but the thing that we then, when we, when we dug into it, we didn't see much... You know, in terms of that public coverage, we saw very little from the health community pushing back on that statement and talking about the importance of some of these policies um, for, for, for our um, health. So I think there's, there's the direct action, but there's also a whole range of other actions that need to be taken um, from that health pers perspective. Okay, do you want to comment on that? No, we'll say, we'll move on. Um, right. Maybe, actually, I forgot, people are, oh, what a terrible chair. People are meant to tell us who they are and where they're from, and then we'll know whether they're plants or not. So please, <laughs> please tell us uh, who you are and where you're from, and, and also if you're new to this space, I guess. Yes, I'm Marcel. I'm a public health student from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. I just finished my dissertation on building climate resilient health systems in the Philippines, and I talk to um, physicians at the local level, community health workers. And yes, to the point of, you know, healthcare professionals are the most trusted in their communities. But the reality is in the Philippines, if sometimes they are the only physician for 200,000 people um, in, in a sprawling city. And so they're overworked based on my, my data. They're overworked, underpaid, not motivated at all. Climate, the impacts of climate crisis is there, they understand it, it's the way of life, but they just have to deal with a lot of competing priorities. And second point is that they also have this power struggle with their mayors. They are appointed by their mayors, but they also need lots of uh, funding and support on that. I guess my question would be, yes, they are the trusted voice in the community, but if they have you know, a, a long laundry list of things to do as administrators, managers, intersectoral coordinators, physicians, how do you even add and engage them and add this climate, you know, um, action into the mix? I guess that's, that's a main thing for me. Um, I'm a science communicator and I would be, want to help, um, you know, engage them um, and, and find a way to, to provide them the tools um, to put the climate crisis on top of their, their agenda as well. 
I guess that's my question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marina. Yeah, that's. I think that's a really um, important point that is how much are we asking from people? But I think with the health professions, there's an opportunity uh, to ensure that it's not an added layer of complexity to their work, but it's actually embedded within everything that they do. So to give you an example, when a GP sees an elderly person as part of their, their whole preventative care uh, pathway, there should be some advice on taking care of the heat, on um, changing their habits, on ensuring that they're protected and they're aware of the climate hazards. So I think it's about embedding it within what you do, not adding an extra layer. And for that, education of health professionals to understand where those links are is essential because otherwise it's an extra burden. If you're not taught that from the first moment that you enter medical school, and if the hazard of climate change that has been labeled both by the WHO and by the Lancet, the biggest global health threat of the 21st century, it's very difficult to be able to address it as an extra layer. So I think we have to redefine the way that we do here. I think we also have to rethink the way that we approach preventative medicine, primary care and community care, because there's a lot that is going into treating of disease and not thinking about health in the holistic perspective. And precisely what Mark is talking about, health doesn't happen in hospitals. Health happens in, in cities, in houses, in hospitals we treat disease. Thanks very much. Okay, let's take a question. Um, I'm going to go right to the back there. Hi there. Thank you so much for the talk today um, and the commentaries as well. Um, oh, please I've... introduce yourself. Oh, yes. I'm Sasha. I'm Canadian. Um... <laughs> okay, that's important. Um, I'm a master's student in public health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and I'm also um, an activist and a campaigner for climate issues. Um, and indeed for climate health. Um, I suppose my one of my questions is about this role of youth in the topic of climate and health. We've seen young people really come to the forefront of a lot of the climate issues. Um, and in these different forums that we're talking about, translating into policy, translating into education, translating indeed into healthcare systems, do you see that there is a role for young people and indeed for intergenerational forums um, in pushing that agenda forward. Thanks, so that's a question role for young people. I'll take one more question and we'll answer them as a group. Let's go with the gentleman right there next to you. Just, yeah, thanks. Thank you, thank you for the talk today. My name's Aaron Malik. I'm a principal at the Boston Consulting Group and a Climate Health Fellow at the World Economic Forum. Um, one of the narratives that we're trying to push within the forum is the idea that climate health impacts uh, are impacts on the entire economy in every sector, not just healthcare. And therefore, every sector has to act to protect against climate health risks and build resilience because we can't leave it all in the healthcare sector to solve. My question would be, how do we drive action and incentivize action from economic sectors that, you know, traditionally haven't focused enough on health, let alone climate health? Um, you know, whether that's food and ag, construction, insurance, uh, all these sectors that have a role to play. Thank you. Great. So how do we drive change in economic sectors? Can you hold those thoughts? We'll take one more question. Um, where are the, perhaps this gentleman in the, Purple top, yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Carmel McClelland. I'm a, a physician and a master's student uh, at UCL in health and urban development. Um, I, I just wanted to speak about kind of the, the main trend in urban, uh, urban development at the moment, which is the growth of informal settlements in the global south and how a lot of these technical solutions that you described uh, will apply to that setting. And then also how as urban health practitioners, we are thinking about like the determinants of the determinants and thinking about say like the uh, kind of with a, a global justice, glo global solidarity lens and thinking about the, the imperialism, the neocolonialism, the neoliberalism. Lovely, thank you very much. So I think the, well, so the first one was a role for the young. The second one was how do we drive economic sectors to behave like we want the health sector. And then the third one, I, I'm sort of pulling a question out from it. I, I think use the word intern, uh, informal settlements. Does that mean, I'm probably not meant to use the word slums. I think you think about that kind of thing. And so how, you know, this is all lovely, but if you're living in a slum and also it sounds very much, this is the uh, wealthy North talking to the rest of the world. How do you deal with those challenges so it doesn't all look very colonial? Three good, tough questions. Do you want to go first, Marina? You get all the difficult questions. <laughs> all right. Actually, I can see I can see Maria's. Uh, why don't you go first? Because 
Uh, we have to fiddle with the sound to get you on. So you go first now, please, Maria. Sorry. Very quickly on the economic arguments, I think we need to look a little bit more at the externalities. As you know, on climate change discussions, as Marina was saying, the loss and damage and all the externalities caused by the combustion of fossil fuels that are not normally con contemplated. The World Economic Forum is helping on that, but I think we need to advance a little bit more. And um, the combination of, of the, the health arguments with economic one, hopefully that will provide a little bit more of, uh, of uh, argument, but it's not, uh, I think it's not, we are not missing arguments. We are missing a political will to do more. That's why we need to create this movement around and be very strong on the pressure we put on our politicians. And for putting pressure on our politicians, we need to create the demand by our citizens. And to do that as well, we need to make sure that they understand that there is something that they are gaining with. And it's not just uh, for an elite that are environmentally friendly people, people who love to go by bicycle, when you are a poor a citizen and you need your very polluting car to deliver your, uh, you know, your vegetables or something that makes you uh, alive, we need to work on those tactics and how to bring that um, part of the society on board and not giving the impression that we are working only for the elite. We need to make this more popular, and then we will have this movement in, in the population that will. Probably the health arguments will be the ones that will mobilize anyone, starting with asthma and, and, and finishing with other health arguments that are very powerful and we can spread. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Marina. And don't feel the need to answer all three questions, but just if any of them grabs you. I have more courage now after listening to Marina. <laughs> yeah. um, so let me start with the engagement of economic sectors. Because I think that is a very important uh, point, and I, I'm glad that the World Economic Forum is here represented. Um, it's both the, the, the economic cost of the health impacts of climate change, but also the economic opportunities of addressing uh, climate change through better and, and healthier populations. And for example, there has been some studies that uh, indicate that, firstly, um, jobs related to the oil and gas sector are much more harmful, are less healthy, but that per unit of investment, you can generate three times as more jobs in the renewable energy sector, and that those jobs can be local, can, can, can develop local um, economies as well. So there is a, a big economic case for healthier populations for the transition towards a healthier economy. Um, I'm from Buenos Aires, and if anyone went to Buenos Aires, when you enter the city, there's this huge slum yes. next to the poshest side of the city. It's absolutely bizarre, and it's spreading and it's growing, and we have huge informal settlements there. The problem of informal settlements is absolutely a, a problem of governance. There's, it, it's 100% a problem of corruption, governance, often kind of narco-traffic and a few other uh, kind of structural issues. But one of the big problems that they have is that their energy bills are completely unaffordable. They couldn't pay the energy bills, so they are, they're linked to the informal energy system, which means that there's a huge insecurity there. There's a huge risk of fires that happens in the summer when the, the, the grid is overwhelmed. There's lack of access to, 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 to electricity in general. In many other informal settlements, you don't have electricity at all. So when we talk about kind of electrification, the just transition, it also looks at kind of those um, settlements. The problem is that if you don't have governance, if you have corruption, then it's, it's, it's impenetrable. Um, so I, I think kind of that's a, a much bigger conversation. And just very quickly on youth, I have often fights with my boss, Anthony Costello, which is your boss, I'm realizing, <laughs> by the um, yes, well. <laughs> about the involvement of, of, of youth. And I find it heartbreaking that, we, that, that we're feeling that we need to encourage young, young people to engage in such a, a, a heartbreaking conversation that is their future is on the line. It's heartbreaking that as adults, we're not taking responsibility for our own actions. It's heartbreaking that they are having to speak out to defend their own future. So I, I, I wish that they didn't have to engage. I'm heartbroken that they do have to engage. But as they do, I think we should offer their platforms. Yeah, just say um, on, on the youth thing, I think there is already a lot of uh, youth engagement. Um, I've done some work with the Natural History Museum who do, uh, they organize um, with, with uh, different youth groups, they organize uh, a week called um, Generation Hope, where they bring in 
different youth activists to m meet with different, um, it might be climate scientists, it might be health practitioners to discuss some of these issues so that they can take that into their work. So I think absolutely it is. And I think the other point of mentioning that is uh, the point about it can't all be the health sector, and, and, and actually it's not. Like, there is a range of different actors within society that are, are, are thinking about like, health and climate change. Um, I think it's a really important point in terms of the inequalities, the global inequalities, the historic uh, role of these things. And uh, Marina earlier mentioned issues around litigation, around loss and damage. And I think absolutely, you know, one of the things that is absolutely needed is, is a transfer of, of resources, a transfer of funds from Global North to Global South to, to help that just transition, to help support um, some of the changes that are absolutely needed. So I think, again, what we're seeing um, is the health argument being used in some of those cases. Some of them are coming from young people who are taking their governments to court for the things that are going on in terms of the health impacts elsewhere in, in low, in, low and middle-income countries. So I think absolutely all of those things uh, very much uh, I, I'd agree with. Yeah, um, just I mean, I'm still thinking. I think we need to align a bit more the, the health argument, what we're trying to make here with the economics argument. And I, I, I think economics you know, is still driving a lot what's happening in the world. I mean, that um, we need to be able to show more that, you know, the cost of inaction is going to be much higher than the cost of action. And I think a lot of people don't understand that, except industries like uh, insurance. I mean, we've see, just seen it with Milton. I mean, in the U.S., I mean, they're estimating a $50 billion uh, loss because of damage, et cetera. And now, you know, insurance companies are pulling out of Florida because it's going to be too costly. I mean, all this uncertainty, what's happening. And, you know, we need to get that more across. I mean, that, you know, we can't keep going on like this. Um, you won't be able to get insurance for a lot of things anymore. Also, a lot of the actions what we do is preventing uh, healthcare costs in the future, I think. And that, that's also a very important uh, argument uh, to do this uh, and to take this. And it's not only, you know, thinking about simply about patients, about health. No, it's also about employment. I mean, it's very costly to industry, to ec um, economic sectors, if people need to stay at home, that they can't work. I mean, and the cost of, of these losses are huge. If people need to go for early retirement because they're too ill and this kind of things. I think this story has not fully been told and we need to make that clearer. Um, just only using the health argument is not going to change what we're doing at the moment. It's, we need to link it to the economics uh, as well. Thank you very much. There are loads more questions in the room and online, but we're going to move towards the end now. Um, so I, I'm going to share with you a couple of reflections as somebody who's not an expert. And I think really the biggest challenge actually for this community is um, accessing people who are not experts and have not spent the last 20 years concerned about this, but have spent the last couple of years concerned about it. And um, so one of my challenges to you as a community is that uh, it's complicated, right? For somebody like me who wants to know some simple things to do, I only, it was only at our at the Academy of Medical Sciences joint event with the National Academy of Medicine in America on climate change that, again, I was chairing, uh, that was about a year ago, that I learned that the three uh, most important things I can do as an individual, I was told, were eat less cow, um, have uh, fly less and have one less child. Now, so I, ch I ask everybody that, do you know what the three things are that you can do? And nobody seems to know. So maybe that's not right and you can debate it. But people who are not mega interested in it need very simple uh, messages. And then even only yesterday or two days ago, did I discover actually um, that there are, and those, some of those are difficult things for me to do. Um, cow and kids is okay, but it's hard to be a, a, to have an international research program and be an international vice president and never get on a plane. Now, obviously, we do as much as we can on Zoom. Um, but uh, only two days ago did I discover that actually something really useful I could do is change my bank and write to the bank manager or the central bank telling them why and change my energy company and tell them why. So, I mean, that, I don't want to be arrested or thrown off the GMC register uh, for my activities in this space. But I think, you know, people need very simple, clear messages, and those are not coming through. Um, I'll stop proletizing now uh, and, and ask. Well, I, would, I don't know. I have the option of giving each of you one sentence before we go to Richard. 
and if you'd like it. And this one sentence will just be, you know, we challenged the, the speakers. We've heard lots of negative things over recent years, and we, people are beginning to understand there's, there's trouble. Uh, some people are telling us, someone told me yesterday, it's too late, forget it. Um, but we challenged the speakers with uh, talk, telling, talking about positive things that we can do. So would you like to finish with a sentence each on the sort of one message about something that we can do and should be doing it? And then we'll come to Richard for his closing comments. So we'll start with Maria. Maria, so go ahead. Apologies. Uh, it's difficult to summarize in one sentence, but three things. What you can do as an individual, what you can do as a health professional or a member of a community, and how can you use your vote to influence those politicians that are around you? So yes, the combination of positive arguments about our health and our economy, uh, less apocalyptic and most, more uh, positive message to generate more engagement by our people. I think the health argument is a win. I know, it, I know it's a challenge and I'm not asking people to summarize in one sentence, but just uh, give us one active positive thing that we can come away with if, if you can. I'll start at that end because you feel, you're feeling picked on, Marina. <laughs> <laughs> um, perhaps I can mention that, and thank also Richard, that actually the talk is going to be published in The Lancet. I don't know if it's mentioned, but you can all read again. I mean, if you missed things, I mean, for me, and thank you so much. Of course. My main thing is I think we need to step a little bit outside our bubble. I mean, um, as health professions, also as, as researchers, sometimes we think that more research is better and then, oh, we're going to convince people. And actually, that's not always the case. I mean, there are many other uh, reasons why people choose to do something. And we need to understand that better, react to that, why that is. Because uh, the great majority still doesn't buy into the arguments that we're having. So how can we get this buy-in that people actually really change um, not only the policy makers, but also the, the people in, in the street, I would say. And I, I'm trying to talk to the normal people, and sometimes it's very hard to convince them. And I wonder why is that? I mean, that it's such an important topic. I mean, why don't you think? Why don't you care about your children? I don't agree with the children argument, uh, by the way. The whole <laughs> population is going down, as, and... That's a shame. And maybe the I, end of society, I think, if we go to down too quickly. So. I'm sorry to say that, because I actually adopted two kids when I worked overseas, so I thought that put me in credit <laughs> okay. meant I could eat lots That's of good, but... burgers. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd say in one of the slides earlier, there was that triangle of political will at the top, and I guess I'd push to say um, that there isn't really such thing as political will. What there is is a series of political processes and actions that we can take. So thinking beyond the notion that the problem is political will, but thinking about what are the actions I can take that might be direct, that might be indirect, and responding to some of the things that we see in the news as health practitioners. Thank you, very clear. Yeah. Tom, you stole the, the one that I generally use, the one about the bank. So I'm going to use another one. And this comes from a conversation that I had in a, a cross-party parliamentary meeting where a conservative MP told me that he was absolutely for climate action, that he absolutely understood the urgency, and he was for everything we were saying. But his constituents wrote to him every day advocating against climate change interventions. So write to your MP. Like, don't underestimate the power of them receiving a whole lot of letters from you asking, and with your authority as health professionals, many of you are, tell them why. Thanks. That's, 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 again, couldn't, you know, that's easy. Anyone can do that and encourage your friends to do. Also, if you don't mind, for the sake of people who are new in this space, like I am uh, um, relatively, I just want to explain that the business about writing to your banks and uh, energy company is because they, have, they make choices about whether they invest in green investments or uh, dirty investments. And so they need to know why you are changing. But, Richard, you've got the simple okay. task now of just... Uh, I've been watching for the last half an hour the drinks being assembled at the very back, so I don't, I don't want to um, take up more of your time, but look how...
far we have come in a relatively short time. When we published the first commission on health and climate change and had on the front cover that statement about climate being the greatest threat to global health in the 21st century, when we launched that, a lot of very senior people didn't like that message. Very senior people in the medical profession who thought it was an exaggeration that we were uh, exploiting fear, that we hadn't got the evidence right, that this was not science driven. And now look, we have won that argument amongst ourselves. I've just come back, sorry, it was only a one and a half hour flight from Berlin. Uh, there was the World Health Summit. Three days of discussing the future of global health. One in five sessions was dedicated to some dimension of climate and health. So we have mainstreamed this issue in the world of medicine and health just in the space of shortly over a, a decade. That's an incredible victory. And if we can keep that pace up over the next decade, then I do believe that our aspirations can be fulfilled. But we must not underestimate the political challenge, and I do want to emphasize the point that Nahir made. If you looked at the, and I'm going to be a bit domestic now, if you looked at the adverts that ran in the Daily Mail before the election from the Reform Party, every single one of them mentioned net zero. Net zero is being mainstreamed by our right of center political parties as a major issue to strike fear in the population and draw them away from progressive viewpoints. That's not just happening in the UK. It's happening in France with Le Pen, it's happening in Germany with AFD, it's happening with Maloney in Italy. This is a worldwide reactive movement to our success over the past decade. Which brings me to the final point. This is not about winning or losing. We are engaged in a continuous struggle every single day. It is a political struggle and we should see the science that we are responsible for generating, for publishing, for being stewards of, as instruments for political action. That is our job, to be politically engaged as citizens who are also scientists, public health activists, doctors. So let's not shrink away from that struggle, but remember it is a struggle, and every day we wake up, we have to recommit to that struggle, and I believe if we do so, within the next decade, we will have achieved the success that we've achieved in the past decade. So let's go for it. Thank you. Richard, um, Richard, thank you for finishing on a positive message. I, I know I can always rely on you. I'd like to thank Richard and The Lancet for supporting this joint venture. I'd like to once again thank our speakers, Mark, Marina, Maria, and Nihir. Thanks to um, the Academy of Medical Sciences team for putting this event on. And um, I, just a reminder that uh, you can watch the live stream uh, recording, uh, which I will be doing because uh, there's such a lot of great ground covered. Um, there will be the publication in The Lancet of the commentary uh, of the article that you've written. Um, there may even be, there's been a lot of talk about health. <laughs> I, hope, I hope someone will take a photo for me now that I can then they'll send it me that I can use. There may, we've talked a lot about healthcare. There may even be something in the Lancet letting everybody know about the Royal College of Physicians of London Green Physician Toolkit. But now, as a reward for all of you for your great work, um, but not for the panel who need to stay for a couple of photos, as a reminder. <laughs> uh, please go and, and have a drink, and thank you very much for coming. Well done. Well done. Well done.